as I said, my guest is on the line. And my guest, as you've been the last few days, I've been putting out on my social media sites, is Angelica Bean. And Angelica is a doctoral student in the Department of Sociology and Criminology with a concentration in criminology and inequality at Howard University, where she is a Frederick Douglass Fellow. As a researcher, Angelica examines race, gender, and sexuality as it relates to domestic intimate partner violence in the faith-based community. Implications of her research agenda will provide a greater understanding of how marginalized social groups, i.e. women, racial minority groups and communities, etc., adopt, internalize, negotiate, and challenge hegemonic conceptions of race, gender, and sexuality. Currently, Angelica is serving as the fall 2017-2018 president of the Graduate Student Council. Prior to Angelica's arrival at Howard University, she obtained her Bachelor's of Science degree in Christian Leadership from the College of Biblical Studies in 2010. She continued her higher education pursuit and earned her Master of Arts degree in Sociology from Prairie View A&M University in 2012. Angelica is a proud United States Air Force, I know that's right, veteran where she served as a security forces police officer at home and abroad. Off we go into the wild blue yonder. Because of her keen ability to innovate, organize, direct, and implement sustainable programs for communities, she aspires to obtain a position with a think tank centered on social economic injustice of communities. And Jerrica, welcome to the Reading Circle Microphones. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Medley. <laughs> you can call me Mark. <laughs> I'm got, I mean, that's what my students call me Mr. Medley, but everybody else can call me Mark. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Oh, that's, I, wow, that sounds pretty impressive. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so okay, Air Force, you notice I, I jumped at that because I served in there as well. I, I, a lot of my guests, we have a lot of commonalities and similarities or a lot of things in common. So as I'm reading in the bios and I see something that we have in common, I usually light off and there's a lot in your bio that we have in common. I can see you in the faith-based community as well in the Christian school and... Yes. And as you know, the first that's what I was playing prior to us coming on was the gospel music. And if we fin depending on when we finish between now and nine o'clock, I may put it back on, or if we run till nine, then so be it. But in between that and, and you know, time we end at nine o'clock, I'll go back to the gospel music. But the Air Force that hit me because I did nine years there in the Air National Guard in the Air Force where I was a jet engine mechanic. And I I was just posting on Facebook yesterday that there were some good years, some good memories that I had with the Air Force. So I can certainly, you took me back to Lackland and McGuire and all the different bases I've been on. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and I stood out there on the flight line with you. <laughs> oh, all right. Now, that there is no, I because see, I'm, I love aviation. That's one of the reasons I went in the Air Force to begin with, because I love jets and I love airplanes. And right. there, I cannot describe, the because I worked on fighter jets. I worked on the F-4, then we converted over, we did KC-135s, but we would do maneuvers, or a lot of times I would be out there on the flight line. I can't explain to people, for me, what that experience was like to be around that much power, to be around that aircraft and the, the pilots and, and the coming and the going of the plane, to see them take off, to see them land, to bring them in, to marshal them in, so forth. Right. I, right. When people would ask me, what is that like, I could not put it into words. So, you really can't. No, I mean, it was it's a special. A it is. It was. It was a special experience, especially since I'm into aviation. It was a really a special experience for me. But uh, so when I saw that just now, reading that, I was like, "All right, now Air Force." I'll say. So, so you're a Renaissance woman, young Renaissance woman, because everybody so far I've interviewed on the show about the book about News Chaser, you all are all young. And that's, yeah. that's, that's a beautiful thing. I mean, because I'm, I'm encouraged because I work with kids every day and I'm constantly trying to help them understand you can do it. You can make it. I don't care what your background is. Don't care if the fact that you're growing up in an urban area. You can do it. So the fact that I'm talking to all these people that are doing it or have done it is always an inspiration for me. So just like whenever I spoke with, I'm trying to think, Jamie a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I was inspired by her and prior to her, I think it was... Was it Anne Marie? Yes, I always want to call her Mary Ann, but I think it was Anne Marie. And so I've just been inspired in Denise or Ayo Sakai, as you all know her. I've known her for it's, 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 it's almost. Denise and I have known each other. It's getting close to 20 years. It's about 17 years. I think I met Denise in 2001, 2002, somewhere around there. But it's getting, it's getting upwards of almost 20 years. And, and the two of us, when we connect, we have a blast. As a matter of fact, she was the one that brought the book to me. 
whenever it was in its concept form. And then it was released, and we hooked this up to get everybody on the show, and it's been a whole lot of fun. And each one of you have come on, and as I was saying a couple of minutes ago, it seems like each week that you all come on, the president does something that falls right in line with what we're going to be talking about. <laughs> yeah. Right, exactly. Can you not do anything, sir? Can you not do anything? Can you just slow down? <laughs> <Anything>. <laughs> so the book is News Chaser. The Rhetoric of Trump in Essays and Commentaries. It's edited by Daryl Twa. Or Twa how does he say his name? Taiwo? Taiwo? Daryl Taiwo Harris, PhD. The forward is by Michael D'Antonio. And on the inside, you have various testimonials, of which the Reading Circle is one of them. Matter of fact, it's the second one. If you open this first page and look on there, you'll see the Reading Circle commentary in terms of the book. And it is filled with contributors. And this morning is Angerica Bean and her chapters, chapter 19, misogyny. Donald Trump, racism, wow, rhetoric, whoa, and women. Mm -hmm. And we had a little bit of all of that this week, tipping off with Charlottesville. And right. each part of, of Angerica's title was impacted. Needless to say, because at the rally, you had the KKK, you had the white nationalists and white supremacists. So there goes the racism. Then you had the rhetoric. You had all the, the first commentary <laughs> that the president made was very vague. Everybody thought it was kind of like, okay, you really didn't say much. It was just very kind of open. And he said, all right, he didn't have a lot of information. Then the second one, he looked like he was in pain. Because it was scripted, he was reading from the teleprompter, it wasn't really his word, it was the speechwriter's words, and you could tell that. But boy, that third one, he let it out. The real President Trump came out on that third one. So there goes the rhetoric. And then, of course, right. the women, of course, and we lost a woman in that struggle with Heather Heyer, Heather Heyer, however she says her name. So, as I said, each time in Divine Providence, something happens during the week that we would be talking about that is appropriate or pertaining to the chapter so i'll tell you what uh angelica let's kind of roll the tape back when did you when did you get into your train of thought you're like because i mean right now you're a doctoral student you're working on your phd but i'm looking at your bio here we have the faith-based community you're talking about understanding social groups particularly racial groups and community where did that come right. from so um well let me start off by saying thank you mark again for the opportunity and also, thank you for your service. I really, I really appreciate this opportunity, and I thank you for um, being an F word fit. And so, I kind of really wanted to go back to that, um, the F word. I think that when people serve in the military, we tend to naturally kind of be political. Um, we and I served as a cop, so with me being a cop, you know, we were on the ground. I had a secret clearance, so here what's going on nationally. I served at, like I told you, at home and abroad. Um, and I served at Lake Unite Air Force Base. And because I, you, did, did you, serve, you said you served at Lackland, right? I was at uh, Lackland. That was for training, of course. And then most of, all of my time was spent up here in New Jersey and McGuire, with the exception of when we okay. went out on, on, on duty. Okay. Well, I was, uh, my second base after Maynard, North Dakota, was um, Lackland. And, I mean, not Lackland, um, Lake Unite Air Force Base, which is in Europe. Um, and you had, back then, I'm not going to sound radio, but it was an interesting base. And, oh, I'm sure. Um, yeah, I had a secret clearance, and I used to have a lot of protests and things like that. We used to have people jump the fences all the time um, to come and protest the base and things like that. So I kind of really became just really ingrained in politics at a very young age. I was 19 um, when I, I was stationed in, in Lake Unite, and I automatically had to start watching things about national security. You know, we were in Lake Unite Air Force Base, and we got briefings about going off base. Don't wear your uniform or... Um, you know, be cognizant of, of the area that you're in as as a veteran, you know. So you kind of get these briefings, and it kind of just automatically makes you political. And then when I, I got out um, of the military, I went back to Florida. And um, I was I was in Florida, and I originally started studying some stuff with cosmetology, and um, me and my husband was military, and we watched a lot of things about politics. And so I kind of, my passion kind of stemmed from the military, um, and serving, and from that point, to be honest, I've been political since the military. Um, and as a, 
I would say to the point that I am now, I would say the transition or the shift came with me um, probably after when I got to HBCU. I think, I think it was preview. I think it was preview. <laughs> well, see, that's a good combination. That's a very good combination in terms of rounding because I love the government. I loved America. But having served in the military and having, like you just said, because I had a secret clearance as well and knowing what I know, I don't put nothing past us. Nothing. I really don't. <laughs> right. And I don't either. I, I don't either. So I've, I've watched some things happen on, on base that was not happening in the media. And I'm a and I so I watch the news. I'm like I'm watching MSNBC. Right. MSNBC right now. I watch CNN. Um, I watch the news. Like I cover the news. I swear. So you know. Um, <laughs> and so I think <laughs> always post with them. So I trans when I transitioned. Um, and well, let me go back. So the military made me political. I started to study theology, and I'm a Christian. I'm in ministry. I work with children. You know. Um, and I'm also a parent. I'm a mom. And my son is in the Navy. And um, so I'm always going to be following everything that you do or whatever, you know, because with me being in and understanding exactly what goes on on those flight lines, how things are moved around and people don't know that it's moved around on those flight lines and watching it and serving and being in that position and then not be having enough rank to say what's going on, but to understand what's going on. Right. It made me political, you know. So I, I do have a, don't get me wrong, I, I have, I'm, I'm, I'm a very proud Air Force veteran. I, I appreciate the vets. You know, but at the same time, serving and then coming out and being a black woman. Right. Um, and also a black mom. Man, my son is 21, you know. Right. So being a, of a young black boy, um, a young black man that's in the Navy now, I'm looking at what's going on on um, the news and in the media and with our president, like you are commander in chief. Right. Now, we've had ones before that was, you know, that I didn't agree with, that I didn't vote for, you know. Um, but I wouldn't say that they was trying to put our military in danger. And when you're trying to put our military in danger, you're putting my son on the line. You know, you're putting my pride on the line. Um, as a black woman, you already looked at me like I'm the lowest, but I serve you. I protect you. My tax dollars pay for you. Well, so, you know uh, what? You know? And that's interesting that you brought that up because there is a I saw it on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all that. There was this picture of Charlottesville where you had the nationalists carrying on and you had African-American officers that was doing the protecting. It's, right. It was, it was, it was, a, it was a, I guess it was one of those worldwide, one of those iconic photos that went out. Well, the brother was standing there. He almost kind of like had his head down. He had his back turned, but he was doing his job. He was, he was a black police officer protecting white nationalists. Right. So let's, let's talk about that, right? At the end of the day, I'm pretty sure if this brother have a family, this brother have to he have to feed his family, right? So you don't go into work and say, I'm going to be about the cause and quit and don't feed your family right. and don't pay your bills. You know, neither did, if he, let's say he didn't vote for uh, Donald Trump or whatever, you know? And so if he didn't vote for Donald Trump, you know, but he's there and he's doing his job, he's been serving on that force for 20 years and he don't agree, he's not about to not um, get his retirement, you know, advocating for um, injustices. He may advocate in his own way. He may be in those positions advocating his own way. We don't know that. So to make assumptions about exactly what this police officer is doing or why he's doing it, I just think it's faulty. And now, I think it's I, I'm with you. He was doing his job because, like I said, I was like, you know what, brother? I ain't mad at you. You were doing your job. I felt, I felt bad for him that he had to do that particular job protecting those particular people. And But right. then at the same time, he was the bigger person because knowing what those folks felt about him, he still did his job. So he was on point as well as we always do. And because right. I'm working our way to your to your chapter because it's all relevant. And you're absolutely right. right. I mean, this is because see again, whenever I was I was in during the Gulf War, the first one. During the first, not not the second one, but the whenever the older Bush, the first Bush was president. I was in then. And the, because the war only lasted two weeks, I didn't get a chance to do any action. Matter of fact, my right. troop, we were ready. We already had our bags packed, wills done, uh, the power of attorneys done. We were. They already told us, if we call you this particular time tonight, we're out. But the war only right. lasted a couple of weeks, and my unit didn't get called. But <laughs> in terms of what you were saying of putting the military in harm's way, this man's mouth is putting the, the country in harm's way. 
Exactly. All the time. All and, the time. We, and that's the whole rhetoric piece, right? Yes. Like you're always just you always just talking off the cuff and you're not thinking about your saying what you're saying. And if you even if you are thinking about what you're saying, because you've never had any consequences, you know, for any of your actions, you know, you've you've not paid uh, workers for the work that they've done for you. You know, your family gave you money. Um for you to start a business. You know, you didn't have to actually work to earn that and know what that's like to understand that it's, that it's, you could possibly lose it, right? You kind of operate different. If I know that I can lose what I have, I, 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 I show some restraint. You know, I understand that if I say things, um, if I say things that are harmful to people that their feelings are hurt, or if I do, as a black woman, you know, if I um, commit a crime, I'm going to jail. I'm going. It, it ain't going to be, oh, and Jerry can need a learning curve. No, that's not. That's not how. That's it's correct. Going to go. I'm going to have immediate consequences. He's been in a, in office for eight months, and everything he's done, and as quick as he's taken this country down, he have no consequences. This the Republican Party, his cabinet didn't hold him accountable, and look at what that got them. Yeah, right. All right. Listen. Right. Like and and see, I'm I'm with you. He hasn't had any consequences yet. <laughs> But they are, I mean, let's put it this way. I think each time we have another one of these antics, no, I'm going to say it this way. Actually, there has been consequences in a way of what you just said, of what he's not accustomed to. Because he is not accustomed to getting this much pushback on something that he said. I mean, I think, and I said it earlier before we came on the air. Me personally, I think if Donald Trump could go back to being plain old billionaire businessman, I think he would do it. But right now he has the same face. He had no clue when he ran for this job what it entailed. No clue. He thought it was going to be a piece of cake. And I'm going to tell you what. He looked at Barack Obama and said, if that black man can do it and it looks that easy, certainly I can do it. That was his thought process. And nobody going to tell me any different. His thought process was, if that black man can do it, I can do it. Because he called... McCain a loser, he called Romney a loser, he called Hillary a loser, he thought anybody that lost to Barack Obama, he thought, oh, they was the height of loser. So he right. thought that job was something very simple, and right. it was not. White privilege, so right. white privilege really confused him. That's exactly right. The job is not simple in no stretch of the imagination. So then he gets on there and says, oh, I didn't realize health care was this, was this difficult. What do you mean? Everybody that's come along knew health care was that difficult. But my point is, back to your statement, no, he hasn't had consequences per se. He's been able to run amok. He's been doing it all his life. And now, though, he is beginning to face consequences of folks are pushing back. And what where we're leading to, in my belief, is I, before it's all over, I believe the entire country is going to push back. And that's kind of, we're almost at the brink of that right now. Where we I are, think, and I, I, right. I think, I'm grateful, I'm grateful that the country is starting to push back. I just, this is part of me that just really cannot, I'm angry, right? Like, I'm angry that it took for... <laughs> I want to say something. Oh, I, 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 yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I like know. Post. Now you want to post? Oh, because you didn't post, you know, at first. Right. You know, and it's been people dying. As a matter of fact, we just got, I was just watching on the news this morning when I got up how this black man was getting beat down in the streets by some cops. How many of y'all going to post about that? Right. How many? Oh, whatever, you know. But everybody got something to say. And I'm talking about black people. Why people, I'm talking about everybody. So whatever you have something to say, but we've been facing injustices. But That's you can correct. Jump, you can jump on a bandwagon, and I'm not mad. I need you to jump on a bandwagon. Whatever it took for you to jump on a bandwagon, thank God you jumped on it. Or whatever, you know. But at the end of the day, it just says something about what we're not seeing every day. How we're numb to particular behavior. Right. You know, we don't, we don't see that, you know, it took for some, a, a white nationalist with a torch for you to remember back in the 60s of what happened and to be able to identify with that and then say, okay, well, I'm going to fight about this cause. You know, you didn't want to fight when it, when it's, this black man just got shot by the police. Right. You know, and you see, want to point us and tell us to be quiet, be I don't understand it. This is my thing, and this is what I've been telling folks. I don't give Donald Trump too much credit, but the one credit I will give him is he did not false advertise. He did not put on a show. He did not put on an act. The Donald Trump that we are seeing is the same Donald Trump that was in his early years as a boy, his teenage years, his 20s, his 30s, his 40s, on up to now his 70s. He has right. not changed. So in terms of him, I'm not necessarily mad at him per se, because it's not like he fooled me. 
It's not like he showed one thing and then once he got elected, all of a sudden turned to this. That wasn't the case. Who I'm angry at is America for putting him in there because they saw that up front. And that's where you kind of get into in your chapter and some of the things that were said. America saw that during the campaign. America saw that throughout Donald Trump's entire career. And yet... Right still put that man in the seat. I'm, I'm reading here the quote that you have in here from the Huffington Post in 2015. Right. Laziness is a trait of blacks. I have a great relationship with the blacks. I've always had a great relationship with the blacks. Now right. I was in the Huffington Post 2015. You know, it doesn't really matter what the media write as long as you've got a young and beautiful piece of, okay, I won't say it on the radio, mm -hmm. like you wouldn't have your job if you weren't beautiful. If Hillary Clinton right. can't satisfy her husband, what makes you think she can satisfy America? I've said if Ivanka weren't my daughter, perhaps I'd be dating her. Not to mention whenever he was on the bus with the reporter talking about where he grabbed women. And, and yet, right. with all that public information out there yet with all of that even whenever he was running whenever there was the one black guy that was on, you know like, look at my african-american right. you might as well said look at my nigga i mean seriously that's really what that said i exactly. mean and, and so we knew that and yet he still got to the seat so what right. does that what does that say about us i think that we objectify women not only do men objectify women you know, women objectify women, right? And that you're, to me, so when I say that women, not all women, let me not overgeneralize, but women objectify women. You know, so you can look at this woman and say, okay, well, she's just like this one individual situation. It's the ideology behind that. It, it is this hegemonic idea that, you know, that you're superior to me or whatever, you know, and I'm here to, to satisfy you sexually. I'm here to be, um, to, um, I'm here to just meet all of your needs. I'm here to cook for you, clean for you, you know, and to do all of the things that you need me to do. But I don't have a brain to think through processes and to, and to do research and to put out science that's going to change the world. I'm not able to do that. You can, you, can object, you can objectify me. And Donald Trump has only dealt with women that he's been able to objectify. That's correct. His wife or whatever, you know, which is why he can just walk off and not hold his wife, not have that intimate relationship like we saw with Michelle Obama and Barack Obama. Because they were, they were equal, you know. No, he sees his wife as you're there, you're pretty, I can date you, you know, I can date you, and you just stand here pretty and you help me get deals. No, sir, no, sir. Women think these days, they write these days, they produce these days. And to be honest, we've always been producers. Right. You know? We just don't get the same type of credit. And so, and when I say that uh, women, women do it, because we know that his, his um, voting base was white women, right? Or whatever, you know, black women. Uh, black women voted for Hillary. Right. Older black women voted for Hillary. Oh, whatever, you know. So in spite of everything we say about Hillary, black women was able to see that uh, Hillary was educated and that she um, she suffered through her own things and she came through her own things, but she was able to overcome those things and she was going to be the person, the next person to lead this country. But no, oh, whatever, you know. They saw Donald Trump. These white women saw Donald Trump, oh, whatever, you know, and was willing to hold on to that ideology and say that this is about God, and this is about religion, and this is about my Supreme Court vote, and that I don't want gay rights to progress. because that means, So let's get into the whole gay rights thing and objectifying women. All right, so you want to objectify women, and you want, you, don't, you want to stop gay rights, you know, because you don't want nobody to have agency over their body or whatever, which means that you're okay with this man being able to take care of you and take care of your family and, and do whatever he has to do. So if he sees you as sexual... That's fine as long as he pays my bills or whatever. You know, it's like, a, to me, I, I equate a borderline to like modern day slavery or whatever. You know, like you agree to just stay in a situation where you don't think, you don't have a brain. He thinks for you and your white power and your white privilege gives you a certain seat at the table. You don't have to sit at that table anymore. You don't have to sit at it. Build the table. You're, you're capable of doing that. That's absolutely right. <laughs> ask, for, ask for your own money or whatever, you know, because you're making a sister. All of the sisters, white, black, green, Hispanic, we all are doing it. But no, they choose to serve on the Donald Trump. They choose to, you know, hold on to their white privilege. And I don't even fault them because I do believe in my heart of hearts that it's, it comes from um, religion or whatever. And I am, I'm a Christian. I love God. You know, um, I study the Bible. I'm intricately involved in the church. I'm in ministry. I love God. 
but I don't check my brain at the door to church. If you sitting over, I there know that's church, right. You telling, you telling me something that don't align with my views and my values and my agency and my autonomy. I'm sorry. I was sitting here every Sunday and give money like I give to any organization. But what you're never going to do is control my control my brain or my mouth or whatever, you know, or what I have to do for myself. So if I got to get out there and work hard and do what I got to do to feed my family, to feed my son or to feed myself, I'm going to do that. And if that means I'm going to work a mediocre job to do it so I'm not subjected, and, you know, up under a man, I'm going to do that. I'll do that for my family because that's what I believe in. So I believe with this thing with Donald Trump, it was white women believing in Believing in an ideology that's not, that don't help them, it oppresses them, and they don't know that, you know. So I don't, just like I was saying earlier about the black cop, you know, he's doing his job. Absolutely. Serving her God. You know, she's serving her God. So I'm not going to condemn her because she voted for him, you know. I just feel like, okay, America needs to wake up. They need to be more conscious, and you need to be more open, you know. I'm not going to tell anybody. I'm not interested in what you're doing in your bedroom. I'm not right. interested. At the end of the day... I'm trying to feed myself, make sure Donald Trump don't send us, send us to war so that my child is not at war or whatever, you know, and I have to go home or I have to be with my child. Those, like, the basic, the basic things about life is what we need to get, get back to, and the media don't cover that. So we keep running in circles around Donald Trump and what he's doing and how he's doing it, and it's suppressing our country instead of focusing on what we should focus on, and that is dealing with where we are today as a people. You well, know, the bottom line common. is, with all this nonsense and rhetoric, nothing, at least, because you hit on something in terms of what the media covers and what they don't cover. There are some things that are going on in spite of the distractions. A lot of laws and bills are being passed that folks don't know anything about because we're focused on Bannon leaving and right. Scaramucci leaving and Trump said this, Trump said that. But in the meantime, Congress and the Senate, they are doing something. They're not just sitting idly. They're doing something. A lot of it, a lot of stuff, like after, like you'll hear about something that was passed during the time that Trump was doing this. Now, I don't know okay. if that's necessarily by design or not, but like you were just talking about in terms of being open, we need to get beyond the nonsense and, and the chaos so that we really can get a better understanding of, hey, whoa, whoa, what kind of laws are you all passing that's going to affect us? Whoa, whoa, are you sending us to war? What's going on? Are you what? I mean, there's a lot of wag the dog going on. <laughs> right. And it reminds me of like, you know, people are looking at the 60s, which is why they can jump on it, right? Because the 60s was our... our era when we were revolutionary and we were able to get things done um but i i would argue that we need to go back to the 800 1800s when they separated you know the argument against blacks and whites you know poor white workers poor black workers you know um the kind of economic base and what was going on and how they divided us and made us think that we were that we should be against each other absolutely you know, instead of working together in order to progress you know donald trump is wealthy, and even if he's not wealthy, he has a lot of social capital because we don't know, right? He never, he never showed us if he was wealthy or not. Um, so, um, but I do think that this argument, of, like the white nationalist, the white supremacy, all of that stuff started in the 1800s. You know, so we're not only looking at the 60s; we're looking at the work that started in the 1800s during the Black Reconstruct. You know, when it, it might even go before stuff. that. I mean, this I have, I have never, I do understand. Let me take that back. It's not that I don't understand. I do because it's all about power. It's all right. about money. And and, right. and and when you really get down to it, in my view, and this is the Mark Medley view, that's why I have to put that disclaimer on the views and opinions heard here are solely those of the hosts and guests and may not necessarily reflect the station. There's some jealousy rooted in there. There's some, I mean, right. this whole, because I, one of the things I posted the other day is if you ever notice with that so-called supremacy bunch, they're not the brightest bulbs on the tree. Right. That that I mean, for somebody right. to be supreme, I mean, they call themselves the intelligent race, or they have the whatever they, that gene is that uh, supposedly that they're the most intelligent being. That's why they call themselves supremacists. They're not. They're not the brightest right. bulbs on the street, and never has been. None of those groups. The KKK hasn't been. The nationalist group, the the supremacy groups. None of them are the brightest bulbs. There's some jealousy inherent in there. And if you look at particularly these first seven or eight months. Most of the focus of Donald Trump when the chaos hasn't been going on or what has caused the chaos is his trying to undo what Obama has done. Most, right. most of the he things. Feels inferior. Right. Yes. Yes. He feels inferior. And he, he operates like he's inferior. And I'm yes. Like he's the person to break it, right? Like when he knows that he can make a better decision 
and he know that he's like messed up really, really bad or done something to um, tear our country down, instead of him going back like most presidents done, all of our presidents that we've done, people that we didn't agree with, went back and they tried to fix it. Right. You know, they tried to, to make amends and for us to be able to go forward. He don't do that. Because he feels inferior, what he does is, I messed up, so I'm going to break it, so y'all can fire me anyway. It's almost like he's used to disappointment. He's used to being inferior, and I'm just going to operate in this. I'm going to operate in the coward state. I'm going to operate, you know, any kind of way, and I don't care what happened to y'all. No, so it, you're I'm absolutely right. And, and the word you used, inferior, is a very good word because it's an interesting psychology. You all are PhDs. You're sociology, psychology majors, whatever. The whole supremacy thing really is rooted in inferiority. So I feel like I'm inferior. Right. Right. I feel like, you know, I know in my heart of hearts I'm really inferior, but I got to project that I'm superior. So therefore, right. that's where you get this whole group of now people that come together and try to purport this supremacy or this being supreme right. when the truth of the matter is no no you're not supreme you're inferior that's that's something psychologically wrong there but you're trying and the sad part is they were able to pull it off especially right. during that time frame you were talking about the 1800s on down through the civil rights movement but i'm a right. firm believer i don't think they're going to get that off in 2017 i think there are too many people as the president can say many sides i think there are too right. many sides now that is not going to allow that particular faction to flourish now i could be wrong i don't think so but i i mean i don't think so either i, I really to be honest and i was talking to my girlfriend last night well my colleague i was talking to my colleague last night and I was telling her that I honestly believe that America is at its best right now. Yes, you know? in a <laughs> in a crazy sort of way, yes. Right. And she said, why would you say that? Like, we're so down. I said, but we're at our truth. America has never been at their truth. You know? I said, in this moment, we're at our truth. You see the underbelly. You see, the, you see what America really is. You see racism. You see everything that you hate about me, you saw with Barack Obama. Right. Everything that we don't, you know, that... That people, how people view the president and all of the, you know, the evilness that he's spewing, the rhetoric that he is spewing right now that's coming out of his mouth is the, the, the darkness of, of certain people coming out of white America. Because I do not want to overgeneralize. I do not believe that all white people are evil. There, see, not, that's why, I was, and, and I agree with you. That's why I think, because this whole, this, this, this awakening is not just happening for quote unquote minority groups and when I say that I mean people of color you have a lot of white folks that are saying this is ridiculous that weren't saying that 40, 50, 60, 70 years ago you know, you know, you know what I think too I believe I believe that Donald Trump with this with Heather um, Bentley, is that her name? Meyer? Higher right higher Heather Higher right uh, Hair Higher how T is H-E-Y-E-R Hair higher. or Higher I'm not sure of the pronunciation but I think it's Higher he gave white people a platform to talk about race relations that America has never been able to give white people because of Donald Trump. You know, so I believe that because she died and because people started to pull out, white America has always wanted to speak up, but they didn't have a platform. Right. They didn't have a platform, you know, because it's not acceptable. It's socially not acceptable for us to talk about race. I'm not going to talk about that. And what if I what if I mention it the wrong way? Or what if I say that I really stand? Well, I understand this about black people, but I don't understand that about black people. What if I understand, you know, it, we're, we're social scientists. We're, we're it, you know, we're scholars. So we're discovering, right? I'm pretty sure next week, school starts, I'll be learning something new. I'll be excited, right? Right. We're all learning. We're all learning. Behaviors learn or whatever, you know. Um, education, everything that we know, we're learning those things. So I believe that there are some things that white people know. But if, if they are being attacked on that platform, on a platform um, where they want to talk about um, black people in a positive way, but they have a negative image in black for, about black people in another way, they're, and they're spitting out just speaking points that they're hearing on the media, black people are going to attack you because your speaking points are bogus because it's subjugating knowledge, right? And so this knowledge, this white superiority knowledge, is what always comes to the forefront. But as they're progressing and as they're learning and, and as they learn through the eight years of Barack Obama about black people, they need a platform to talk about race relations, too, and to not be afraid. I believe Heather Heyer gave them that platform. That's and an interesting Donald, view. 
with people pulling out, you know, and people pulling out of um, from standing with him, you are seeing more white Republicans, more, more white Republicans, and not only white Republicans, you're seeing even more media comment, commentators um, starting to speak up and talk about race relations in ways that they've never been able to talk about it. Now, before uh, 45, before Trump, we had black people got the opportunity, you know, and it was Black Lives Matter. It was not Democrats. It was not Republicans. It was the Black Lives Matter movement that right. gave black people a platform and also gave people that believed in diversity, gave, that just believed in equal rights for all people as a whole, humanists, humanitarians, you know, who believed in that. They gave them a platform. That was through Barack Obama's era, you know. Now that we switched and we're on a different era, and this incident, as tragic as it is, she's given people a platform that has never had a platform to talk about race relations. Do you think it would have been different had she been Latino or African-American? Oh, I was getting to that, yes. And she's a white woman. She's a white woman. And I don't say that in a negative sense. And I don't, I don't want to qualify my answers, you know. But I, I, she's white. She's a white woman. And they stand behind their white women which is so, you know, the whole black feminism, white feminism looks different, right, or whatever, you know, what a black woman looks like free in comparison to what a white woman looks like free is two totally different things. So they're going to stand behind a white woman. Had she been a black woman killed, white America would have been like, oh, okay, all right, all right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Y'all always want to say, you know, there's, it's this normalizing of, of black. Um, right, death. The victimization of black women, yes. right, that, that, people, that America is acceptable with. Yes. Sometimes, even, in, sometimes with these, even within our own um our own party, our own race, we will accept something that happens to a black person. Not everybody, right? But I do believe that those type of things happen, you know? So I believe with Heather, they've always been able to stand behind a white woman or whatever, you know? So now that she's died, we could talk about it, and we could talk about it within the context of race because we don't, because of Donald Trump, right? You don't stand with our veterans. That's who we are. Right. You don't stand with our white women. That's who we are or whatever, you know? You're dispelling everything that we believe that we are. Black people have been spewing the same thing forever. We looking at them like, what you talking about? This has been going on or whatever, you know. Correct. They never saw it because now it's hitting home and we can see it. And we can see it and we're also allowed to talk about the things that we don't understand in a gentle way, in an understanding way, in a compassionate way, because I'm not only standing for human rights, I'm also standing for my core beliefs and that is it, within itself. It just is at its natural state. It's it's linked within. I mean, it's um, it's tied within that uh, superiority piece within that um, what they believe that their genes are superior. But that's all within our education system. So now you're against that, you know. And I can deal with these other areas because I'm standing for my values when I stand for for nationalism, or I stand for our vets, or I stand for our military, and I'm also standing for our um. Families, that's because they believe it's family. They don't believe that it's hegemonic. You know, they don't believe that it's heterosexual. You know, not just heterosexual, they just believe that it's, I just stand for God and family values, and they don't think that it's linked to white supremacy. They don't see that at all. And because they don't, now that a white woman has gotten killed, you know, then it's like, okay, now we get to see, but we also get to deal with the fact that it was behind people standing for equality, and it's giving them a platform that, to be honest, I can appreciate. Well, I tell you, I, it's it, your theory is interesting because, especially of what we're talking about in the book, there is a connection between the grab them by the crotch comment, and I'm being nice when I say crotch. I could say the other word, but I won't because it's radio. If I was talking to you personally, right. I would have no problem saying it, have no problem writing it. But there's a connection between the grab them, there's a connection between even how Melania is, I guess, I don't think Melania is in the White House. I could be wrong. I don't know. Did she move in yet or is she still in New York? But from what I heard, she's still in New York. Okay, I thought the same thing. Never hear from her as a first lady. There's a connection between that. There's a connection between his treatment of women in general to how this whole thing with Heather was handled. Right. And all I, of it. I agree. Right. And all of it is rooted in the view of females from his perspective like you said in the earlier part of the interview they're objects so the fact that we lost heather didn't matter to him i mean he did not reach out to that family 
until matter of fact most of the things the president had done even the statement about charlottesville wasn't done until he got pressure from the media got pressure because everyone this is what I, every time i would watch the news i would hear the media saying the president hasn't done this yet he hasn't said this yet he hasn't done this yet it would be after that that it would be done the president hasn't made a statement on charlottesville yet that's when the statement came out president hasn't contacted heather's family yet. that's when he contacted heather's family and the mother said on yesterday i'm not talking to him because he placed my daughter in the same category as the neo-nazis he equated right. her as being a part of the same ilk as them so i am not going to talk to him and i don't blame her but my point in that whole thing is going back to your book is uh, your your contribution to the book the racism rhetoric and women there's some serious issues there, and i'm looking at your first as we go into the first part of, of your contribution it says i was born in beautiful brown skin i know that's right and that is all i know Despite the criticism of some, I have learned that my black is beautiful and nothing will take that away from me. It has been motivating to watch President Barack Obama, someone who looks like me, run the White House for eight years and even more inspiring to witness First Lady Michelle Obama tackle serious social and political issues with grace, poise, dignity and intellectual respect. Michelle Obama embodies everything black women like myself aspire to be black, empowered and free. Right. For those of you in the listening audience, you to read the rest of it, you have to get the book. News <laughs> Chaser. I want to whet your appetite, but that's the part of Angelica's contribution. And the title again is Misogyny, Donald Trump, Racism, Rhetoric, and Women. It has been a total and bla- that's where I think, you know what? And and again, whenever we make this commentary, when I get I love discussions on race because my discussions on race have nothing to do with me hating you because you white. It has nothing to do necessarily, even though it does to some degree, because I tell people all the time, I'm not anti white. I am pro black. So it doesn't it's not a matter of. I hate you or I don't treat. It's not that we need to have some honest discussions on race. It is what it is. Truth be told, as a country, as a world, from the get go, we ought to have been celebrating and embracing our differences to use that to our advantage instead of separating and trying to do the power play. See, that's what the whole supremacy thing was about. It was, again, like I said, about power, about money, about trying to make one feel like they were better than the other over something that had nothing to do with whether you're better than or not. That whole gene theory of Darwin or whoever the heck it was, way off base, but yet they bought into that lie. This whole thing of the brain and the, the, all that nonsense. That's just flat out nonsense that folks bought into to try to make themselves better than the other. When the truth is, there is no better. We're all human. We all bleed red. We all have the ability to think. We all have the ability to create. But again, historically, you were talking about school. I mean... Right. There are so many inventions and lists of things that were done by folks other than Caucasians. Because there are inventions that were done by Latinos, inventions that were done by African Americans, inventions that were done by Indians, inventions that were done by all the different races. But in the history books, you only hear of one group. That's been the issue, and that's by design. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And and science within itself is problematic because when you start having you know um you have a oh my god i can't think of the word i'm looking for but you do have like this this um it's disproportionate it's disproportionate right so we know that america only has like one to three percent of people that you know um actually have phds right with howard being one of the largest producers of of black phds right you know um and with that being said it's only one of the it's one percent right and then we don't even make up a, I don't even think we make up a full percentage of the people that actually have PhDs. So uh, when a Howard student goes out into the world to, to address whatever social issue that they're dealing with or whatever, you know, they decide to, to ground their research in, whatever that subject is, whatever that topic is, they want to tackle that. They're going to tackle social injustice, you know, and they're going to deal with this particular aspect of society as it relates to, to black people. We are so low in number. In order for us to get things funded, those fund the the funding and the money comes from grants and proposals, correct? And issues, right? Because people people that have um, people that have uh, social problems don't have money, 
right? But but because America don't typically value humans like we should, right? And we want to say, you know, oh well, we need to pour more money into our government and go to some war in some other country to secure whatever that's going to some corporation. You know that whole line of things that we do when we spend our money in other places, talking about oh well, we're worried about the national debt and we're not worried about social issues. You know, well all of the the reason. Well, I don't want to get into the reason that I believe that we don't worry about social issues, but I do believe that the funding for people and to help people and to, eat, you know, to level the uh, playing field with money has to come through our scientists. And so in order for us to get that type of uh, that type of money and that type of funding into um, into our institutions, then we need researchers. Well, if you're if you're white, I'm not if you're white, black, Hispanic, Caucasian, you're going to kind of research the things that interest you. Right. So Correct. If we have less than one percent, and we're coming out of particular institutions. If we're coming out of uh, white institutions that don't, don't even believe in the things that we believe in, or they're catering to a different audience, we're going to do that type of research. And I'm not mad at any brother or sister that do that type of research. Do that research. Do it well. We need you in that field, you know. But at the same time, science and the numbers, and we we have to prove that in large numbers that we're having these problems, you know. Right. Well, we're not. We're, we're we don't have anybody in those positions representing us we don't have it's poor representation for america as a whole so you have this less than one percent that's going out there to do the work to be to do the work in the field and you have scientific knowledge that's backing uh ideas and backing concerns of people that don't look like us or if they are saying okay i'm i'm concerned with equality i'm i'm concerned with um i'm concerned with gentrification a lot of people is concerned with gentrification but they're dealing with Subjugated knowledge that looks at information like it's from a, a advantage point of, I hate to say this, but this is just my view, um, white supremacy. Then you have a whole bunch of people in those fields doing that type of work, you know, and basically just perpetuating the problem over and over and over again. No, you're right. And I'll tell you why, because you can make statistics and data say what you want it to say. Exactly. That's, I mean, and... and I get data. I had this discussion and argument all the time because it, ed, and I, as an educator, because when I'm not doing radio, I'm the principal of a school and we're constantly getting hit with data, 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 data. I get that. I was also in the business world. I did 15 years in marketing for AT&T. I get data. I get numbers. But I also know, just like I made the statement earlier about having served in the military, I don't put nothing past the government and I don't mean that negatively. I also know you can make numbers say what you want them to say. To your point, exactly. if you're the group that's conducting the study, you can make that study say what you want to say. So let's say I'm a supremacist. I can make that study come out in my favor. Exactly. And the questions that I choose to look at as a researcher, right, after we're doctors, we we launch the research project. It's on that, you know, the questions, right? And so if, I, if I'm so if I'm the type of, if I'm a researcher who is not that skilled with skills and I don't know how to put skills together because that's not my field, you have majority of white people putting together skills, you know, and then I'm going to use that skill and I'm going to go measure my people with those skills and I think exactly. I'm going to data. No, you're not. You're getting, you're getting skills from people that don't look like you. That's correct. And that's making that's analyzing data about you that don't have anything to do with you. That's correct. I don't even so that, it's, That's absolutely right. And see what It's complicated. I years ago Probably, let me see, maybe close to 10 years ago now or a little less, I started a blog called The Critical Thinker. And in that blog, what I do is kind of, I don't care if people agree with me or not. I don't write it for agreement. I, I, I write what I write in The Critical Thinker to challenge folks to think. And my tagline is, you know, for those who choose to move beyond the sound bite. One of the, right. one of the criticisms I have of the average person in America and maybe around the world for that matter, but more so I, I can speak to America because I live in America. We are big on the sound bite. Although we take anything that's given to us and run with it as if the gospel, no research, no triangulation, no study, no like, okay, you know what? Let me, let me take a look at it. Does this make sense to me? Some people might call, some people might call me a conspiracy theorist. I don't care if they do. But when you look at some of these things and you put some of these facts together, some of the things that we're told from the government, and anybody else just don't make sense. Like to me, right. 
the the assassinations of John F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Robert F. Kennedy, Malcolm X, 9-11, those things don't make sense to me based on the story that we were told. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And the same thing yeah. holds true what we were saying, where, where the supremacists got there. And I'll have to go back because I don't know if it was Darwin or it was, a, it was a few of them that came up with this whole master race thing. Aryan nation and Aryan this and whatever. I'll have to go back and do my, because I know it, because I studied it before, but it's just not coming to mind. But there's a few of them, as you just said, that ran that re- so-called research, put that out there, and folks took it up and ran with it. If you exactly. look at, if and, you, and, it, and they, there's, there's been specific research. I, I, I have a paper on um, the condom. It's a book. Um, <laughs> this is a book called The Condemnation of Blackness. It deals with science and um, science and race, right? And talked about how there was a scientist that came from Europe, and he, when he came from Europe, he did some scientific studies in order to help. It, it was like this. Um, they were trying to exploit black people. Right. Or insurance claims, you know? And so what they did was they put together some scientific projects and they um, launched surveys and collected data on scientific scientific projects. And um, and the numbers started to say, oh, okay, well, you know, black people really are inferior or whatever, you know, because we did this study, this study, this study, and these are the numbers that we got. But it was intentionally done like that from the from day one or whatever, you know? And so, and and it's continuing to be done like that. And the thing is, you have nobody challenges. So let's say, Angelica, well, when I do become a doctor, goals, goals. Uh, so when when I graduate from school, and I'm like, okay, what I want, what I want to stand for is, I want to be a person that goes out there, and I want to dispel all of the skills that talk about black people in a negative way. That's going to be my cont- contribution to right. the field. I'm not even one percent. I'm not even. It's not a lot of us, you know, or whatever. So. And then who's going to actually want to help me with talking about race relations, you know, in America and scientific studies? Or who's going to even feel empowered to do that or have the skill set to do it? When we already, do, we start behind. It's just the truth. Well, it is. And, and you know what? Launch it anyway. Somebody will be there. Somebody will right. join you. Launch it. Once, you, once you're done and you'll be done when, whenever you're done, you will be doctor. Matter of fact, I need to start calling you Dr. Jerrica. I'll call you Dr. Bean. Uh, Thank you. I'm <laughs> and, 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 it's, and you know, it's funny because, you know, I, it's 8 o'clock. I need to change over into the new hour, but I'll tell you this story. Into it. Denise or Io is one of the, there's like three or four people I know that even though I'm not a doctor yet, I haven't started working on my doctor. I do have the two masters and the bachelor's and a whole bunch of certifications, yada, yada, yada. Still teeter tottering on whether to work on the doctor or not. But Denise is one of the few people that already call me Dr. Medley. I have, it's, oh, it's wow. like, it's like three people. That I know. It's funny because there's another young lady who does the same thing. And she texts me the other day and said, Dr. Madden, I didn't recognize her number. And I said, now look. I said, I lost my contacts uh, you know, a little while ago. I need you to identify yourself. I said, now based on how you started your message, you're one of three people. And I knew it wasn't Denise because I know Denise's number. But the person, when she identified herself, I said, I knew it was you because you're one of three people that called me Dr. Medley. These people are trying to speak right. into existence. So I'm going to do the same right. thing for you, Dr. Bean. But put, put, that, right. put that research out there because someone will join you and, and support it. Because, again, it's needed. And you're right in terms of the platform that Heather has given folks to now come out and say, whoa, because like I said, I honestly believe there's, there's no way statistically, I just do not believe that there could be more, and I might be wrong, but I think the supremacists and the nationalists and KKK are going to have a war on their hands like never, ever before, because people that look like them are going to be on the other side of the war. It's it's, exactly. it's it's not going to be like all white against black, all white against people of color. It's not going to be that. It's and, not that anymore. And I honestly, and I said this early on, I honestly do not believe as much. And I, and Jericho, when I tell you a Dr. King fan, none no bigger, you're talking to him. I mean, I have studied Martin Luther King and Gandhi up the wazoo. I right. mean, I have studied I love them. Gandhi too. I have studied well, them extensively. But with that said, I honestly don't believe the millennials, the latter part of the baby boomers, boomers and the Gen Zers are going to take what the folks in the civil rights movement took. I don't think they have the discipline, the patience, nor the fact that they're going to stand there and let somebody beat them down without striking back. 
They're not. And and also millennials are extremely educated. I may not be saying Correct. specifics right now, you know, um, because I don't have all of these conversations all the time, you know. But we know things, and, I, and I'm a large concept person, so I understand the concepts behind things, you know. So I really believe that the millennials this day, they understand concepts. You know, and, 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 and a concept is a leader can be faulty. That's a concept. Right. You know, like they, they can, and a millennial knows that. So I'm not going to, like I said, I'm not going to check my brain at the door of the church or whatever, you know, in spite of the fact right. that I love that. I'm going to be at the black church. I'm not going to whip or whatever, you know. I'm there. I'm rocking out with them. That's where I'm going to be. I'm on the fight, battlefield fighting for my Lord, you know. But at the end of the day, right. millennials are not going to say, oh, let's be passive. Right. You know? let's, let's act as if these things don't exist, and I'm just going to, you know, pray my way through. Millennials are not having it. And they're not. And, and that's, it, that's neither white millennials nor black millennials no, or nobody, Asian nobody. millennials or Indian millennials. Any, none of them. That's why I said okay. I don't think. I think those folks that we saw on that Charlottesville video are going to find themselves in a sure enough minority. Right. Yeah, I agree. I agree. They are the minority. You are the minority, and you are not America. No. Because America is not their place. And you want us to go back to, to that place because you feel inferior. Absolutely. You know, oh, you know. And and everything that you everything that you believe is grounded in inferiority. And I, 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 that does bother me that you can't see that what you believe in is grounded in you actually being inferior. And I think it's because as a black woman, we've always been taught that we're a strength. Right. Right. America sees us as strength. They've only known us as strength or whatever, you know. So you see me as strength, you advertise me as strength. Even if you want to exploit me, you still exploit my strength. Well, I tell you what. <laughs> let, let me let me because I had this conversation with Jamie and a couple of the other folks. Let me roll over to the eight o'clock hour. I got to do the weather and do what I do, and then I'm gonna come back to you and I'm gonna share a story that the listening audience has heard forever. And that's this whole thing with Denzel Washington and Haley Berry back when they won the Oscar of based on something that you just said about the perception and the view. So hang on, don't you go nowhere. Listening audience, my guest is Angerica Bean, Dr. Bean. I'm going to call her that in advance. I'm going to put it out there just like folks are putting it out there for me. WSC, Wayne, New Jersey. On the radio, 88.7 FM. Online, gobrave.org. A tune-in radio station. Part of the William Patterson Broadcast Network. Broadcasting live from Hobart Hall in Wayne, New Jersey. This is The Innovative. I think they're really unique. The Fearless. They have awesome variety. The Kick-Ass. I love Brave New Radio. The Sensational. I've never heard anything like it. This is the one and only Brave New Radio. Here's your North Jersey weather report. We have worked our way up to 70.6 degrees on our way to 86 as a high, 66 as a low. Tomorrow, sunny skies, high of 83, 65 as a low. And then on Monday, generally sunny, high of 87, low of 69. I think we had that eclipse on Monday as well. I keep hearing about on the 21st, an eclipse that we haven't seen in years or will not see in even more years to come. But that is on Monday. And then on Tuesday, as I'm waiting for the system to, to generate itself, it looks like it's not. So I'll tell you what, that is the weather. No, there we go. All right. For some reason, whenever I'm trying to give it, that's whenever it seemed like it wants to generate. <laughs> Tuesday, scattered thunderstorms in the morning, 91 as a high, 72 as a low, mostly cloudy with showers and a few thunderstorms. And then on Wednesday, cloudy skies early, then partly cloudy in the afternoon, stray shower, thunderstorm possible, 82 as a high, 61 as a low. Music, the vinyl frontier. Tune into the adventure zone. Rewind to now. Its weekly mission to explore time honored music, to seek out lesser known bands and forgotten tunes, to boldly go where the music is the star of the show. How you doing, G-Man checking in? Set your radio, computer, and tricorder to the one program that enables you to experience the future of the past through the music. We interface Sundays at 9 a.m. Prepare to be transported to a world where the music is fascinating. Set your coordinates to Rewind to Now. It's the logical thing to do. 
No bones about it. Want to expand your horizons? Want to broaden your mind? Well, listen to the only show of its kind. Listen to The Reading Circle. We bring you what's going on in the world of reading, in the world of books. Sometimes the book may be from 20, 30 years ago, because the thing about books, they are timeless, particularly if there's a good message. And then there are times when we do books that are hot off the press that were just released. Listen to The Reading Circle every Saturday morning from 6 a.m. The Reading Circle with your host, Mark Medley. Only on WP 88.7 FM. You wanted to be a teacher when you were little, but as you grew up, things changed. Teaching just didn't seem like the best option anymore, so you decided to become something else. But what would your 12-year-old self say? Interesting and innovative things are happening in teaching today, so it's time to put it back on your list. Don't try to convince yourself otherwise. You had it right the first time. Find out how you can make more at teach.org. Make more. Teach. Brought to you by Teach and the Ad Council. School is out and summer is here. Join me, Jeff Gamba, every Tuesday from 5 to 7 for your weekly dose of summer sounds. Jump in as we take a ride through time, spinning those feel-good tracks from the 60s, town, summer in the city, 70s, 737, come on, water the sky, 80s, Woo! summer and and those gems from today. So roll the windows down and crank that volume up because the sun will be out every Tuesday and the airwaves will be filled with summer sound. If you're a single man under the age of 35, you'd probably like to know what the ladies are looking for on an online dating site. A guy who had a few drinks and later got pulled over for buzz driving. See, that could cost you around $10,000 in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. And doesn't a guy who's back living with his parents but calls them my roommates just scream, Mr. Right? <laughs> Buzzed, busted, and broke. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. All right, I trust... As I shared that information with you, because I didn't tell you to do it, for those of you who are regular listeners, you know the drill. Whenever we go into that information sharing time, I need you to multitask if there's such a thing. But I need you to get on all your social media sites and let someone know that Angelica Bean is on the line with me on the Reading Circle. And we are having a hot discussion, especially based on everything that's going on. Interestingly enough, as I watch the news each week, they end with this has been a tumultuous week for the president. This has been a turbulent week for the president. This has been the president's worst week. They've said that just about every week now since he's been in office. Each week when you say, okay, when he has, it, I have yet to hear Don Lemon or, 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 um, I'm trying to think of what's his name, Anderson Cooper or Wolf Blitzer or any of the CNN folks end without saying, this has been a terrible week for the president. This is the president's worst week. Every week he's been in has been <laughs> a bad week. And this one, I guess, he kind of bottomed out. Right before I shared the information with you, and Jericho was talking about perception and how folks are viewed. And Jericho, I was sharing with Jamie when she was on the air. And I might have shared it with, with Anne Marie as well. I don't know. People tell me I think too deep. That's what they tell. Oh, you, you know, whenever I have these kind of conversations with folks, they say, oh, you think too deep. And one of the times that somebody told me that was during the years ago during the oscars when denzel and haley both of them won it the same year he was the first african-american male and first african-american female winning oscars at the same time yada 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 and i told folks i'm not impressed as a matter of fact not only am i not impressed i'm incensed i'm angered and they said why and i said well, i'll tell you why because both of them are fine actors and actresses that they played far stronger roles and what they won that award for. But if for those of us who think too deep, back to what you were talking about with perception, Denzel won that award for playing a role cop. And Haley okay. won the award for stripping butt naked in Monsters Ball. Uh-huh. But he didn't read the role for Vincent. Didn't not didn't for Glory. Really? Not That's for Malcolm. Story. Not for uh, all oh. the other powerful. Same thing with Haley. Not for losing Isaiah. Not for Dorothy not Dandridge. For not for uh uh-uh. uh. But, but her behind oh. became butt naked. And I didn't watch Monsters right. Ball. I heard about it, but I refused to watch I it. Watched it. I refused. I refused to watch Monsters Ball. I did see Training Day, but I refused to watch Monsters Ball. And but again, Roll Cop. And promiscuous slut, 
so forth and so on. Just what you were saying. And I also shared with you know my guests and the listening audience, years ago I taught a diversity course and there was an exercise we used to do. We would take huge post-it paper and post it around the conference room and we would put categories on each one. Black man, black woman, white man, white woman, Jew, China, Asia, gay, this, that and the other, athlete. We put categories all around the room and then we gave them the little yellow notepads and said okay this is what we want you to do this is the assignment you don't necessarily have to believe what you're writing on the little yellow sticky but it's something you've seen on tv movies or you've heard for each category write something on the yellow sticky and then walk around the room and post it on the big one of what you've heard about that group and angelica i did that around the country and I might as well have collected the little yellow stickies and kept them with me and stuck them on the board myself because no matter where I went in the country, the same adjectives were placed on those boards. Back to your point. Black woman, loose, a lot of kids, welfare, don't want to work, so forth and so forth. Yeah. Black man, well done, well hung, loves the this, uh, lazy, shiftless, leave his kids, Jewish, money, cheap. So forth right. and so on. Jewelry stores. So forth. I mean, no matter where I went, athlete, dumb jock, no matter where I went in the country, I got those same descriptors to go on the roof. Under white man, can't jump. Provides right. for his family. Right. Goes to work. Under white woman, easy. Stays home. Docile. So forth. Yeah. Same descriptors, no matter where I went in the country. And I traveled the country teaching that class because I was teaching it at that time for AT&T as a part of our diversity. That was one of the assignments. So in terms of the perception, you're absolutely right. Right. That's our review. Exactly. And, and, um, but I, 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 I can appreciate it. So I think that that's exactly how it views. I think because they, you know, America has taught that black women, are, we're over-sexualized, right? As if Correct. we don't um, work and keep our men strong and keep this country strong and, make decisions, you know, like, for instance, like uh, Hidden Figures, right? Hidden Figures is the work, is the black woman's work. Right. I do all the work. You don't ever have to acknowledge me. I am that invisible person in the background. I am your force. Who is bringing this thing forth? Or whatever, you know. Influencer. We influence so many things so many times, all the time, and we get no credit for it, you know? And then we couch it in. The, I think it's our coping mechanism. I don't want to say that we couch it because I don't. I think a lot of things are not people excuses. I, I really honestly believe it's a lot of people's just beliefs. They really believe this stuff, you know. They uh, whatever, do. You know, the the way that we cope is we cope we cope through our religion. You know, we 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 say okay, God is gonna make it better. I can still feed my family. We go back to the basic necessities of life. You know, no, I'm not in harm's so way. Like, yeah, I am doing okay, but you deserve more. And, and, and to own that space and to say, okay, I own this space. I do deserve more. Then the world looks at you. America looks at you like, how dare you say that you, oh, you deserve more than I'm going to treat you and that I'm going to give you. Have I not influenced your whole economy? Have you not based your, based your economy off of my black body? Didn't I start with that? Absolutely. It's and it's interesting way. you're talking about beliefs. But if you, I mean, see, again, this is where you got to look in the Bible and see it for the truth that it is. If you look at Jesus, Jesus dealt with truth. When he went in that church and turned them tables off over and started calling folks yeah. vipers and snakes, and, he was calling it as it was. Now, right. that is at the time they all got together and said he got to go. And historically, yeah. is, I mean, if you look at all of our folks that, that pushed that envelope, the masses get together and say he or she has to go. But you're absolutely right. But that still does not stop us from putting the message out there. And I'm looking right. here so, back in. Queen, in the, I'm sorry. Go no, ahead. I'm looking at the words that you wrote in your book. And he says Donald Trump has used his platform to promote bigotry, dem demagoguery, chauvinism, or demagoguery rather, chauvinism as evidence in part by his constant suggestions of blindly deporting multiple ethnic groups, i.e. Right. or e.g. illegal Hispanics and refugees upon being elected. All women and minorities are suffering from his hateful words. But this paper will focus specifically on the role of his harmful rhetoric and ideology on the degradation of black women. Right. Exactly what you were just saying. Yeah. I'm, I'm very concerned about it because I feel like we're going to be left out of the conversation. So one of the things that I pay attention to is the media uh, images. 
I even paid attention to Macy's um, when the the it was a magazine that came out through um, the mail right after Donald Trump was elected, and it had a its slogan was kind of like the Southern Bill slogan, and all of these it went back to you know I I don't want to say white America, but the image that people that people say is the best image, right? And so Jerrica, you think too deep. Woman. You no, think, you, think, you think too deep. <laughs> Now, I'm being sarcastic because that's what I'm told. When I pick up on stuff like that, and I do, that's what I'm told. Oh, you're reading too much into that. No, I'm not. <laughs> no. It's there. No. What else was say? And as a matter of fact, Michelle was okay. You know, Michelle was, she was tall and long and beautiful, you know. Michelle owned all her black babies, you know. Um, but <laughs> the, these, these images, it was all white women in these long dresses, slim, looking like Ivanka, Ivanka, and then they had one black woman, and she was long and slim with straight hair. And that was, to me, a pushback from what was going on, or whatever, you know, black women being natural, right, or whatever, you know, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have natural hair, and I'm okay with it. All of the black empowerment shirts that was out. I'm interested, to, we don't know right now, because we, they keep covering Donald Trump, so we don't know what America looks like right now, because they're not showing America. They're talking about somebody... They keep talking about Donald Trump and running around in circles behind him not being able to make decisions and tearing this country down. So we don't really know what America laws look like, which is a, a form of America. And we neither do we know what the image of America look like, let alone a black woman, considering that we're they, they put us at the bottom. So what are your the thoughts on Omarosa? The highest educated. What are your thoughts on Omarosa? Because Omarosa, for whatever reason, the, the black journalists felt um, inclined to invite Omarosa to speak at their conference. And then when she did, they kind of like, you know, they were not happy. And I was kind of like, well, okay, I didn't quite understand why you invited Omarosa to begin with. But, and then I saw something that was on LinkedIn that had Omarosa crying because she said all of her black friends turned on her when she started supporting Trump. And I really didn't have no sympathy or no pity because I said, well, I'm sure I they, don't have they, no they, they right, because I'm sure they tried to warn her. I'm sure they said, you know, what's going on, Omarosa, whatever. But, what do you think about her? Because she is the, the one black woman that we see, at least, that's in the White House. I believe Omarosa gets a check <laughs> at the end of the day. Oh, whatever, you know. So she's willing to degrade her whole race to make sure that Omarosa is okay. Omarosa don't know that the reason she got that platform is because black women came before her to fight for that. You came through Howard. Well, you know, I'm going to so tell you the truth. Personally, exactly what you were talking about with that degradation, that's what I think is going on there. You really believe that? Yep. Why do you say that? I'm, I'm going to ask you questions. I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> First off, she came through that game show or that reality show or whatever it was. Th talk to me about what 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 is her role in the White House? Okay, that, 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 and that's what most people we don't know. All right, so I, I, and I, I and see, I have these conversations with folks quite frequently. And again, Mark, you think too deep, but I tell you what: when Donald Trump was running for president, look at the African Americans whom he told it out there: Steve Harvey, Don King, yeah. um, of course, there was Ben Carson in there now, and then Omarosa. But what that said to me, because back to you, these messaging and dog whistles and everything else, what that said to me was the people that I'm showing you that I hang with are the people that I feel represent your race, the buffoons, the comedians, Rain. the shuckers Rain. and jivers. Yeah, that's yeah. that's the folks that was 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 that's that's who started taking pictures with him was the scene. So Rain. what that was saying is I see you all as court gestures and jokers and shucks sh you know shucking and jiving but i don't take you seriously because none of the black folks that he aligned himself with or aligned with him were folks and he and don't get me wrong steve harvey is what he is don king that they're they may be made but they're folks who fall into the stereotypes and the thing is too so i was listening to steve harvey on the radio um station and he was saying oh you know this was before he actually met with donald trump and i think he met with donald trump uh, like a week after if not a week within days so i believe that like we're talking right now some white supremacist is listening to us or whatever you know and probably gonna google us i believe that anything that, that is talking about consciousness or black people thought they listen to that right. and then they attack it with the opposite or whatever you know and i believe that that's been donald trump um that's been the way that he did his whole platform. He watched CNN because with CNN is liberal or whatever, you know, and they talk about a bunch of different views. And then he go on, go on Fox 
and say that he's against everything that CNN is talking about right. or whatever, you know. And that's been a way he's been able to keep his, his platform. He talks out of both sides of his neck. You say you hate liberal, you know, liberal thought, but yet you always looking at liberal thought right. or whatever. And you just use that as fuel for the fire. But anyway, I said that to say that, um, where was I going with that? Um, well, I was telling you the folks that he aligned with to me, and again, because I think to right. oh, represents Steve how he so sees black people. Yes. Steve Harvey was saying that we should take a seat at the table to make sure that our voices are getting heard on his radio station. You know, right after that, he had Steve Harvey. They called Steve Harvey there to meet with them or whatever. I had just heard that on a radio station. You know, then turn around and Steve Harvey taking pictures. You know, so <laughs> it was. I'm looking like Steve. They listening to you, home, and they listen. Steve, don't do it. Don't do it. You know, or whatever. But they listen to Steve, and it, it is how he sees us. But also, anybody that he's willing. They also had a uh, Chrisette Michelle. Chrisette Michelle was another person that stood against black people during a Black Lives Matter movement, mm-hmm. or whatever. You know, so anybody that's going to stand against black people and be used as a token you know to push their agenda or whatever you know they're gonna do it so i I agree with you that yeah they see us as entertainers actors you ain't meeting with no NAACP right or whatever you know right um and even i mean i mean mean, because see this is all it's all subconscious but conscious even that whole debacle with the presidents of the hbcus yeah had the all them african-american men in there and Kelly Ann sitting on that couch taking pictures like a floozy. I want to know why that's still not circulating on social media. I just want to know why no black people reposted that. I just need to know. Not all black people, but I'm just saying that I just feel like there are things that people are willing to get behind. But you know, Kelly Ann did that in front of people, but it let it have been let it have been machine. That's what I'm saying. I mean, girlfriend was shoes off. That. No, girlfriend was shoes off. Legs cou- up in the couch. I mean, she was just looking too comfortable. And you know what I think it is, too? You know, it's, it's, it's a catch-22 to me. I feel like, yeah, like, people are uh, very comfortable with black people, right? Because we make people comfortable. That's, that's what we naturally do. I'm going to invite you over for the cookout, you know? Um, and I can be intelligent about and invite you over for the cookout and still have a good time, you know? Um and I think we make black people comfortable. And I think some people, when they don't understand black people and they've insulted black people, one of the things they understand about black people is that we are down earth people and that we are good people. But I think that they take that too far. You think that just because I'm down to earth and I have cookouts and I dance and I do all of these things, that's the only way that you see me. So you can't see me in this space as a professional. As right. A person who came in here to take care of business, to advocate for funding, to advocate for resources, to make sure that black voice is at the table. You can't see me as that. You only see me as comfortable. You don't need to be that comfortable with me because yeah. I'm here fighting for my people. Right. And see, that's that's I think the issue folks had was, OK, we don't have a problem with you taking a picture. It was the right. posture of how you would like it. Like you said, it wasn't in a professional manner had you been standing there and you know standing up taking the picture with your shoes on like because there was a joke that there is no way in the world michelle would have had no woman in barack's office taking no picture looking like that come on michelle would have told her get her feet out the couch and the fil- know, michelle probably went over there and popped her <laughs> 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 she have gave her that biache what are you doing in my husband's office sitting there like that hey, uh, nice and, and, and and i mean and i'm and I'm, I'm being sarcastic i'm being funny but the bottom line is that was just straight up unprofessional and the question becomes would you have been sitting like that had that been a bunch of if that had been harvard yale dartmouth stanford if that had been those presidents standing there would you have been sitting there like that that gets back to what you were talking about with that comfort thing and i don't have a problem with folks being comfortable hey hey but there is decorum it is it's a time and a place for everything yes it is a time and a place for everything that was neither the time nor the place especially considering race relations in america these oh, men were you know? these men are university and college presidents. Professors, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, presidents, college yeah, presidents. presidents. All right, and I mean, but, but see again, it's yeah. oh, it's all related to your piece in the book. And you know, for those in the listening audience, my guest is Angelica R. Bean. 
She is a doctoral student. I'll call her Dr. Bean. And we're talking about her contribution to the book News Chaser, the rhetoric of Trump and essays and commentaries. And then Jerrica's contribution was misogyny, Donald Trump, racism, rhetoric, and women. Yeah. And the thing is, we knew all this about Donald before we put him in there, yet we put him in there anyway. So that right. says to me something about... And he did lose the popular vote. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that says right. something to me about the country, though. And you're right. A lot of those wives, they did not even talk in one thing, but when they got behind that booth, they did whatever their husbands did. Yeah, whatever exactly. whatever their husbands was, was spouting, they may have been talking something different. Or in their heart of hearts, they might like, no, he's not the one, but they wasn't going against their husband. And I think it's this whole argument, you know, like I said, other people being concerned with other people's sexuality, so gay rights, right? And I also believe that it's, it's ingrained within their religion. So being a theologian, right, coming from theology, I'm not going to stand against my religion for your, for your benefit. You know, that's how they've been able to control America. They've been able to control us through our ideology. That's why black people can still, some black people can still look at themselves and say, you know, oh, okay, well, I'm willing to just, take what I got to take um, in order to feed my family instead of advocating or fighting for something more or whatever, you know, because I see myself in this pl- in this particular place or whatever, you know, or women or men, you know, who won't challenge and, and say, I'm just going to pray about it. God is going to handle it or whatever, you know, because we've been taught that that is the way that we're supposed to handle situations that we don't understand. And when you say, you know, my God, my God only believes in um, me being in heterosexual relationships, a man and a woman, and a man is God, man, woman, family, child, you know, woman, child, or whatever, you know. When I believe that, and it's my religion, it's the core of me, you can't make me fight against the core of me. You're talking about something, you know, we talk about systemic racism. It's kind of like that, right? But in a, on a smaller scale, just me individually, you know. Like, oh, and Jerick, I'm not going to stand against my God. I can't do it. So you tell me to vote for Hillary Clinton. I don't believe in a woman being a president because it's God, man, woman, or whatever. So I'm going to get behind that. that uh, they're not necessarily standing with their husbands, and they can say that they believe in equality for women and that we should be fighting for equal pay. Okay, we'll get through that. We'll get that through Ivanka or whatever. You know, yeah, he did this. Yeah, he did that. But I, I'm not about to put Hillary in. Well, I'll tell you what. I can't see how any woman would believe that based on the fact that you can say when you're famous, you can do anything. You can grab them by exactly. the... I don't see how anyone would think he was going to do that. And in terms exactly. of Ivanka, I always get... The, it's Ivana and Ivanka. Ivanka is the daughter. Ivana was the ex-wife. Um, this... if you, There was a video with one of the supremacists talking about because Ivan, Ivanka is Jewish. She converted over to Judaism because of Jared, because of Kushner. Mm-hmm. But they did a little clip with one of the supremacists talking about... Uh, the Judaism about her being a Jew and every time he sees that Kushner with that pretty girl, is that, uh, how incensed he is. Donald said nothing to that statement. He didn't even defend no. his own daughter. No. He did well, not anybody. defend his own daughter and grandkids. Yeah. He objectifies his whole family though. I know that. You know, so, right. So he sees it. So he sees this. That's why I said America is at its truth right now. Yeah, it really is. You know, now, my thing is because I, 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 I look biblically at this whole situation, and I've been telling people, and I've been posting, if you read First Samuel chapter 8, to me, this is kind of where we are. Because at that point, folks came to Samuel, and they said, we want a king, we want a king, we want a king. And Samuel was trying to say, well, no, you really don't have a king. And at that point, God spoke to Samuel and said, Samuel, chill out. And I'm paraphrasing, of course. Samuel, chill out. This is not against you. This is against me. So God said, all right, you know what? I'm going to give you your king. He said, but this king is, I mean, if you look at first, read it. If you go to first Samuel chapter eight, there's a whole bunch of consequences that came along with that king. To me, that's what we're going through right now in America. Folks, what you just said. No, we don't want that woman. No, we don't. Oh, her emails. Oh, no, not that woman. No, no woman can't. My Bible's. Oh, that. God said, okay, I'm going to give you Donald Trump. I'm going to give you Donald Trump. Be careful what you ask for. You just may get it. And that's where folks, I think when you talk about America's country, I think folks are getting, having a lot of buyer's remorse with the exception of the base. And the base seems to be made up of, because David Duke flat up said it. Whenever he was in Charlottesville, he flat up said, we came down here in the name of Donald Trump. 
We came down here to fulfill his vision of making America great again. Yes, yes. And I, I honestly, I honestly, honestly believe that that he represents, like I said earlier, the core of white America. You know, not white America, but the dark side of America. Right. In America. Right. Or whatever. It's that thing that drove you to the polls. Right. To vote against to vote against your own interests, right? Or whatever. It's that thing. It's that thing that you're sitting on and that you you wanna create distance from. You wanna um you wanna push yourself uh away from that very thing that that's who America is. And that's why I'm looking like which is why I said earlier, I don't even I'm I don't agree with you. I know that what you're saying is racist. You don't even know what you're saying is racist. Right. We've been doing this and now I just sit back I sometimes a lot of times, I just look at the news like, mm, he say something, I'll be like, oh, there you go. All right, good job, Donald Trump. Or whatever, you know. Tell them who they really are. Or whatever, you know. That's what y'all really think. Tell them who y'all really So, you know, not all of them, but I do believe that people just don't know where this stuff come from. And now that you having to deal with your ideology, you have to, you have to deal with the fact that, dang, I am right wing. Dang, I am evangelical. Yeah, you know, it could, right. You're absolutely you right. Know? Because, like I and said, the the for me the key question is: Does that? Mean, and you and okay, let me go back to what you were saying a couple minutes ago. In terms of the core, the belief, the ideology, that's what you've been indoctrinated with, and now yeah. that indoctrination is being challenged. Yeah, it's being challenged, and you have to deal with who you are. That's right. Why I said America's at its best. Oh, whatever. Right. Right. right, because now. at some it point. Off. You, you got to ask yourself that same question that I constantly ask. Does that make sense to you? And you're right. Some of the stuff that's been shoved down our throat or however you want to phrase it, it just, if you really pick it apart, and, and you all are doing doctoral degrees, so I know you all get versed in picking things apart. Okay? If yeah. you really pick some of this stuff apart, it just does not make sense. Right. Where is it coming from? Right. It's coming from your ideology. It's coming from your philosophy. It's coming from your science. And where does all of that come from? It comes from the money that you consistently push into the system. Okay, where is the money coming from? It's coming from the 1%. Okay, well, what, what do we need to do? We most definitely need to make sure that white and black people don't ever get together. Oh, whatever, you know. <laughs> make sure that, that never happens. That's going to be way too powerful. Oh, whatever, you know. So we had people, you know, with Barack Obama, with Hillary, in spite of all of the mistakes that she made, I don't stand with Hillary like that or whatever, you know. But at the same time, Hillary, anyway, I, it was a woman or whatever, you know. And she was a woman that had been in politics for a very long time, and we should consider that or whatever, you know. And after you've been hurt and abused, you learn how to cope within a certain setting or whatever, you know. The way that she coped wasn't enough for people to just stand with her completely. And they was angry over the stuff with Bernie or whatever, you know. No, absolutely and, right. And because I tell you what. I wasn't the biggest. I, I was. I tell you when I was the biggest Hillary fan because over the years my my fandom of Hillary diminished. But in the beginning, when Bill Clinton first ran, I was a I was a big a big Hillary fan. And I'll tell you why because when Bill first ran, they appeared on one of the it was sixty minutes or something, and Hillary and I could not have agreed with her more. Whenever the whole thing about Bill and all those various women, Jennifer Flowers, this, that, and the other, Hillary flatfoot said, "Look, we've told you." Everything that went on or whatever went on, you got the facts before you either vote for them or you don't. Right. And at that point, I was like, you go, girl. Now, over right. the years, right. I mean, cause she was just straight up. Either you vote for them or you don't. We've already get, we've told you our side of the story. We told you about flowers and, 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 and the other one and all so forth. There's no more we can do. Either you vote for them or you don't. I was, I was dead right. set with Hillary. Over the years, I did some research on her, but. Hillary had political experiences right, and I can guarantee anyone in this listening audience, anybody who's listening, we would not be where we are eight months later with Hillary or where we are with Donald. Now, that's for sure. Exactly. Emails or no, we wouldn't have been in this predicament with Hillary. Right. And I'm not speaking as a Hillary fan per se. Right. You know, you don't have nothing even passed. Eight months. We have a whole year with nothing passed. Not that I even want you to. I don't want you to pass anything. Don't pass nothing. You know, or whatever. But... You don't have any major policies back. What, you know, what are y'all doing? Eight months. We paying salaries for people that do nothing. Right. You sit back there and do nothing or whatever. And on top of that, race relations is horrible and people are dying. And we're not even talking about, you know, I talked about immigration and, 
refugees and the way that he had this conversation. We're not going to talk about how we're dri- I'm driving up 495 and I see all of these, you know, one one day I was driving and I just seen every, every so often with so many stops, you know, where cops were pulling people over right after his election. Oh, up, you know, right after he was elected. And I'm looking like they're rounding up people. You know when we're going to find that out? When we count the numbers. Right. Like a two or three in. So right. we don't even know what we're in, right? So we talk about what happened in the 90s, you know, and how um, the what the impact of the war on drugs on America and, and the impact of black men on black women or whatever, you know. So the, the, the loss of the black man and the loss of, the loss of dual incomes when we're already at the lowest you know, the lowest paid. Um, oh, absolutely. If, if we can see, we, man, you could be here all day. Matter of fact, if I ever talk to you offline, we'll talk about that war on drugs thing. That's another, that's another uh, soundbite, another thing that doesn't make much sense if you really peel it back, that there really is no such thing as a war on drugs. As a matter of fact, and we're coming to the close, um, there's a movie. It's called Loose Change 9-11, an American coup. I don't know if you've seen it, but if you haven't, take a look at it. Called Loose Change, L O O S E Change, C H A N G E nine eleven, and it's about nine eleven. I know, I know what we supposedly saw, and I know what we were allegedly told. But if you take a look at that, that'll make you think another way. And there's another one like it. I forget the name of the other one. I saw it a few years ago. But nine eleven may not necessarily be what we were told nine eleven was, and I'll just leave it there. Mm-hmm. But and we're coming down to, and I'm saying all that to say. All these other things that are going on are not necessarily what we they think we are either. And you're right on, dead on point, spot on with, with what you are, are talking about. But I tell you what, I always, you know, in the last couple of minutes, I always shut the mic off and give the guest an opportunity to promote. So listening audience, I hope you've been with me since six this morning. Certainly, if not six, seven, because that's when Angelica joined me. But we're talking about her contribution to the book, News Chaser, the rhetoric of Trump in essays and commentary and she is chapter 19 misogyny donald trump racism rhetoric and women so i'll tell you what i don't know i i I know the book was doing book signings and all that kind of stuff were you a part of that or did that did they kick off yet or are they coming are you going to be at that this is your opportunity to let folks know how to get in touch with you where you're going to be so forth and so on right um so the book signings they're still um planning for it but yes um I am Tanise Fosio. Is um, she plans on uh, making sure that I'm I'm there for the book signing? So I will be there. Um, in the meantime, you most definitely can con- contact me um, on my at my on my Yahoo account. So that's Angelica B. That's A as in Alpha. N as in November. J as in Juliet. E as in Echo. R as in Romeo. R as in Romeo. I as in Ike. K as in Kite. A as in Alpha. B as in Bravo. At Yahoo.com. So that's Angerica B A N J E R R I K A B at Yahoo dot com. I recognize that military alphabet. Alpha Bravo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on November, that's right. <laughs> I'm off the gear. I'm off the gear. <laughs> Well, I have enjoyed speaking with you this morning. I thank you for rising early to join me. Denise texted me and said she was listening from Pittsburgh because I know she took her daughter there for school, but she texted me and said she was definitely tuned in out there in Pittsburgh. I tell folks with the GoBrave.org, you can hear me anywhere in the world. Anywhere you go, if you have the Internet connectivity, your mobile device or the computer or your laptop, as long as you can get to the Internet, you can uh, get to the show. We're also on the TuneIn app. If you download the TuneIn app and put in Brave New Radio 88.7 FM, you can download it on the TuneIn app and then wherever you are again, you can just click that and it will come up there as well. But Angerica, I applaud you. Keep up the fight. Keep up the voice. Keep up Thank the representation. Yes, indeed, Dr. Bean. Keep it. You know, I tell, you know, I tell people all the time, if I, when I finally decide to go ahead and do it, it's not necessarily because I, I really could care less about people calling me doctor or not. <laughs> But I would do it just because I can, because at one point we weren't allowed to, or it was such a struggle for us to. I would do it just because I can. As an African-American male, like you was talking about those percentages in terms of folks with doctorates is so low. Because even the folks with masters, I see here in your email that you have the MA. Even if you look at the percentages of African-American with masters, the number is low. They're low. 
And then I'm you talking like, and I have yeah. two masters and the bachelors and certifications. So if I join that doctorate rank, I, yeah, the, I would do it just because I can. Right. Help our numbers. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's right. Well, I tell you what, you keep representing. I wish all of you the best and uh, have a wonderfully blessed day and weekend. And I'll get a copy of the show to you sometime in the next couple of days because I do record it and I download it into an MP3 link as well as put it on YouTube. All my archives of the show are on YouTube and folks share that out and send that out. So I'll get that out to you. It might be before tonight or either tomorrow night or sometime in the next couple of days. I really appreciate it, Mark. Thank you again for having me on the show. It was really a pleasure to talk to you. Well, same here. And, you know, if we get a chance to talk, I might have, you know, because all of you, your conversations have been so interesting. I might have to take a drive down to that area and tell Io to get all of you all together. And I think we'd have one heck of a think tank conversation. <laughs> that would be good. We'll be up for it, too. I think it would be one heck of a conversation. <laughs> Super interesting. Super interesting. Yes, come down, come down. We'll be ready for it. Well, my daughter's moving down that way, so I'll actually be down there more than I have. And I have family in that area that uh, that been there for eons. But now my daughter's moving to that area in another month or so, another two or th- two weeks, actually. She said, I think she's moving in September 3rd. Um, right. She just got hired by Booze, Booze, Booze Island. Booze Island. She just yeah, got hired by them, so she's heading down that way. So I will be down there more. So I might have to get with Denise and say, you know what, see yeah. if you can get something for all of us to get together. Yes, we'll be up for it. I'll be waiting. So just give me a call, and I'm I'm up for it. I'm looking for some interesting dialogue, and um, with me being a graduate student council president of of the um of the graduate school, it would be great to get some graduate students involved in this type of conversation. So we've been actually having conversations about having small groups to talk about how we can um, engage in intellectual activism. I know that's right. <laughs> Oh, now see, yeah, I, see, I, I'm run, oh my God, intellectual activism. See, activism. I'm running out of time. Otherwise, we'd spend another hour on that because that's what. And, I, and again, I'm running out because I only have a couple more minutes before I'm off the air. But I deal in education, and one of the things I try to help parents understand all the time is: look, do not go to the school board microphone yelling and hollering and cursing the board members and the superintendent out. That will get you nowhere. But what you just said, intellectual activism. activism. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. How to craft these conversations? Right. How to have the dialogue and and writers. We, you know, we're not going to have a history because we're not writing our history. Right. And so we have to. Um, you have to just really just own that it's not going to be perfect. Right. You know, and and just start somewhere. Just start. You know, and and trust yourself, and then let the people who already know it come behind you and knock that thing out and refine it, and so that we'll have we'll tell our own history. I know that's right. Yeah, Subjugated knowledge, right? So we really need our own spaces to talk about these things so that we can overcome them. All you know? right. Well, I yeah. wish you the best and wish your son in the Navy the best and your husband and your family you. and everybody else. Thank you. You all uh, keep Not there, though. I am single. Oh, okay. There you are right now. <laughs> <laughs> Let me say that. I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you what. Have a wonderfully blessed day. You too. Thank you so much. All right. Um, right. Take All right. care Have now. Bye-bye. All right. That ends another edition of The Reading Circle with your host, Mark Medley. Fun and inspiring, educational and entertaining as always. The book is, if you go to my blog, it's also the book of the month on there on The Critical Thinker. News Chaser, The Rhetoric of Trump in Essays and Commentaries.